thank you all. I want to thank you all for coming out here today to support um, Ron Paul and, and even bigger than that, to support the message of liberty. You know, it's really exciting to see so many young people coming out to waking up to the message of liberty and coming out to support Dr. Ron Paul because you are our future. And you guys, you guys get it, you know? And, and that, you know, we have an aging Congress, we have an aging legislature, and you're gonna, you guys are rising up to take the torch, and you guys are taking it in the right direction. And so, so, so I wanna thank all of the young people that are, have come out, that have come out to work so hard on Dr. Paul's campaign, and that have come out, we've had young people out on the sidewalks writing chalk messages. I mean, we have, they do everything they can because they understand it, they get it. And I just wanna ask the young people to bear with us older people. We're, we're teachable, but you just keep at us, you know? <laughs> Some of, us are, some of us are recovering neocons. And so, but don't give up. If you talk to your parents and your aunts, your uncles, the, you know, older people, and they, and they scoff at you, go back again and keep going back. Because that's how us recovering neocons got converted, because people didn't quit. And so the message of liberty in the future is in the hands of the young people, and I praise God for all of you. Our country is in trouble. We all know it, or we wouldn't be sitting in this room today. I do not doubt for a single second that every person sitting in this room today loves America. We all experience frustration and even anger with our leaders, our policies, and our laws from time to time. But no, make no mistake, we love America. <laughs> and just as we must discipline our children out of love if we want them to grow up and be functional, productive members of society, we must also discipline ourselves and our country if we want to have a functioning and prosperous nation and if we want to preserve the freedoms and liberties we hold so dear. But this, ta but this task of disciplining America will be no simple measure. It will be difficult and it will take leadership and statesmanship, the likes of which we have never seen before, to steer this nation back to prosperity and back to the founding principles that made America the greatest nation on earth. <laughs> Doc Dr. Ron Paul is that leader. Dr. Ron Paul is that statesman who can and will guide America home. <laughs> Dr. Ron Paul is a medical doctor. He has been elected 12 times to the United States Congress by the people of Texas, and for over 30 years, Dr. Ron Paul has steadfastly stood for the same principles of small government, fiscal responsibility, strong national defense, individual liberty, and strong family values. He and his wife, Carol, recently celebrated their 55th year of marriage. And since, and since you, you didn't come out here today to hear me talk, so I'm going to, um, say enough is enough is enough of that and without any further um, words here let us stand and welcome the next president of the United States of America Dr. Ron Paul Thank you, Sue. Karen, Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I didn't get it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that very nice welcome, Karen. Thank you for that very nice introduction. I would like to introduce... I would like to introduce my wife, Carol, who's with me today. <laughs> and of our 18 grandchildren, we have one with us, Linda. <laughs> oh, it, it is so great to see so many people excited about a very important issue, something that made America great. That is liberty. That is it. We certainly have been blessed to be able to live in a country as ours has been, uh, based on liberty, based on a constitution, and based on uh, the goodness of mankind. And we had a great nation, the richest nation, it's the largest middle class ever. But today, things have changed because we have lost a, a, a concentration on our values. And we were warned about this. You know, the founder said, we're going to give you a republic but you've got to keep the republic, and the most important thing to keep a republic is the morality of the people. If the people go astray, the government will go astray as well, and that is why this is a moral issue as much as it is a political issue. We didn't get in this mess overnight. We probably won't get out of it overnight, but I'll tell you what, if we continue to do what we're doing now in Washington and with this administration and the current Congress, it's gonna be a long time to get out of this mess. But if we do the right things, we can be out of it in a short period of time. It might take a year or so, but doing the right things, corrections come rather quickly. But our problem is that we've gotten into this mess because government was too big. We had too many individuals in Washington that didn't take their oath of office seriously. We spent, we spent too much money, we borrowed too much money, we taxed the people too much, and we printed too much money. And guess what they're doing in Washington? They're spending and taxing and printing and regulating, and they wonder why we're not getting over this recession depression that we have. Why should we be surprised? What we need to do is say, well, how did we get in this mess? The government wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing, and they were doing the things they should not have been doing. If you look at the Constitution carefully, it's a thou shalt not document, and thou shalt not is on the federal government. It was meant to bring people together and different states together, and the people get brought together, and the government was supposed to be local. But what their fear was is that the government, the central government, would get too big, so they tried to put some restraints on, on the central government. And uh, they wrote into the document, Article 1, Section 8 certainly mentions exactly what the government's allowed to do and what Congress can legislate. And yet today, we have been taught in our schools, unfortunately and tragically, that our presidents make the statement, and it's been accepted, that they say presidents take the position that if it isn't prohibited in the Constitution, they can do anything they want. And that is not right. The only thing a president can do... The only thing a president should be allowed to do is what is explicitly given to the president through the Constitution. For instance, in an, in an open republic, in a true free society, the government should be very, very open. The people's privacy should be very, very secret. But now we have a government that undermines our privacy and keeps themselves secret. The CIA, the FBI, as well as the Federal Reserve operates in total secrecy, and we need to change that, obviously. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
But we, we didn't get in, into this problem overnight, and uh, for months or years at least, people have said, and I've said in the past, that, uh, you know, we should stop this spending, we're passing this debt on to the next generation, and we can't do that. And some people still say that. I essentially don't say that anymore, because I think we're at the point of not passing it on to anybody. Right. What we're doing in Washington today it is passed on to the current generation if each and every one of us are suffering the consequences of many, many decades of the undermining of our personal liberties and the rule of law under the Constitution. The Constitution is very clear on, on several of the issues, on trade, uh, it, certainly markets should be trade, on property, you can't take property without due process, uh, uh, and on money issues, very, very clear. The founders knew something about runaway inflation, they participated in it. They had the runaway inflation of the continental dollar, and they said, boy, this is a mess, let's not allow this to happen again. So what did they put in the Constitution? Guess what? Only gold and silver can be legal tender. That is still the law of the land. And also, there's a prohibition in the Constitution that you can't emit bills of credit, which is paper money. And also, it gives no authority to have a central bank. So the law of the land contradicts everything that we have been doing, and this is very significant because if you look at history a little bit, you will notice that the downslide on our protection of our liberties, our constitution, our economy, and our foreign policy occurred approximately 100 years ago. Certainly 1913 wasn't a very good year for us, that we know. <laughs> Because that was the introduction of the notion to set the stage for uh, endless growth of government and consumption of wealth. And that was the giving up of the giving to the people, the income tax as well as the Federal Reserve, both need repealed. But the prohibitions in the Constitution have been ignored, certainly in foreign policy. There is a uh, strict uh, uh, provision there for having a strong national defense. It was not left up to the states for a national defense. So that is the responsibility and a lot of burden is placed on the president as being the commander in chief. But that doesn't mean that we should have a foreign policy of endless wars, undeclared, unwinnable, <laughs> As a constitutional president, I promised that I would never go to war without proper permission by the Congress through, from the people. And if there's necessity to declare a war, you declare the war, you fight the war, you win it, and you get over it, and you come on home. It's, but certainly since World War II, we have gone astray. We haven't fought a war with a declaration. Not only that, do we allow our presidents to take us to war, we allow our presidents to casually go to war. Sometimes they inform the Congress, sometimes they mention it to the people, but they get their authority from the United Nations. No, we shouldn't ever do that. That is the undermining of national sovereignty, and uh, this, this is one of the problems that we've had. Even today, you know, going into Libya was under, under NATO and the United Nations, and we're in Afghanistan under NATO, and, and it's endless. If we would just follow that one provision, don't go to war unless there's a declaration, just think of the difference of the past 10 years. All those wars wouldn't have been fought. The 8,500 Americans that we have lost, the 44,000s of severe injuries, the hundreds of thousands now begging and pleading for help with post-traumatic stress syndrome and looking for help. And, and also, our national debt would be $4 trillion smaller. That is the kind of debt we have run up over these last 12 years. And for what purpose? This nation building and policing of the world, getting involved in these uh, internal affairs and these civil wars, it isn't to our benefit. It undermines our defense and bankrupts our country. Yeah. 
Not too infrequently when I speak, uh, people will uh, take it seriously and they'll say, okay, yeah, I think I sort of agree with you about bringing troops home, but how fast can you bring the troops home? I says, as quickly as I can get the ships over to where they are and I just bring them home. But then they say, then they say, wouldn't that be disruptive? How could it be more disruptive than sending young men and women over for the fifth and the sixth tour of duty? And now it's being revealed more of the military people are willing to speak out and tell them, telling us about the futility of what's going on. And the one thing that reassures me, not only have I served in the military and during the uh, 60s when times weren't exactly uh, very pleasant, but now, when you look at what the active military and the retired military people do in their picking of their candidate, our, our organization, you know, our candidacy and our campaign gets more donations from the military, active and inactive, than all the other candidates put together, including the president. So the foreign policy obviously has to be changed. We don't have to think one minute that we would be less safe. We would be more safe. We now make the assumption that we can bomb any country, any place in the world. Our drones are more powerful. We have more weapons than everybody else put together. We spend more money than everybody else put together. And believe me, with my knowledge of the military and politics and an understanding, one thing that we have is we have a very, very powerful, efficient military, and we don't have to be worried about being attacked, let me tell you. They are not going to attack us and invade this country. But that doesn't give us license to push ourselves around the world. And this is, the, this is our problem. We have done too much of that, and we have built up too many enemies because of it. The founders were very much aware of this. They talked about the relationship, and they wanted friendly relationship and trade with any country that will offer that. They didn't believe in trying to punish people by sanctions, and they certainly didn't put in the Constitution that if you can find a friendly dictator, you can give them a lot of money to bribe them. That, unfortunately, has been our foreign policy. We go around looking for our dictators, and if they do our bidding, we give them billions of dollars. If they don't do it, we bomb them. And, uh, and I thought, well, there has to be another option, you know, friendship and trade and, and, and uh, at least negotiations with people, which would be quite different. But I failed to realize there was actually a fourth option, which we're participating in, in with Pakistan. Not only do we bomb that country, we give them a lot of money at the same time. <laughs> so it, it's, it's time to become more aware of this. And, and one thing is, is I've been talking about this for a long time. I recall the first speech I gave against going to war against uh, Iraq was in 1990, in, in 1998. So uh, we, we need to you know, push, push these programs because there's no reason why we should continue to do what we're doing because it is literally bankrupting our our country and uh, it is up to us the people if the people speak out believe me government will will change and uh, the government do, does actually reflect the people and for too long we've been too complacent and we were too complacent for too many years decades if not for the last 70 or 80 years we were complacent because we have been a very very wealthy nation we were concerned about the wealth we were concerned about material things it encouraged the, the lobbyists to go to Washington and get this wealth redistributed for the special interest and still we watched it, but today things are completely different because we're much poorer and it's a failed system. The entitlement system doesn't work. Morally, it's wrong. Entitlements are not rights. You are not entitled to your neighbor's property even if you send the IRS after the property to get it for you. Many people have voted for the entitlement system over the many decades with good intentions, and I understand that because uh, there are a few who know exactly what they're doing and they knew the what the consequence would be, but a lot of people say, well, there are going to be people who are falling through the cracks, and the only thing that we can do to help people is have a government program, not realizing that eventually the government program backfires and hurts the very people you're trying to help. 
A perfect example of this is what happened with the housing program. The people who felt good, they're entitled to it, they deserve a house, a free house, let the government do whatever they can. And also, it was this magnificent thing about inflation. Get them to hold a house, the house will go up in value, a $100,000 house will be $200,000, and then the people can borrow against this money, and it'll be a perpetual wealth machine. Not realizing that Austrian free market economics fully explained it, that that's what you call a bubble that's created by the Federal Reserve loose monetary policy, and that's where the trouble comes from. But because so many were uh, convinced that the entitlement system was right and that they grabbed the moral high ground and those of us who disagreed that we didn't care about our fellow man and we were not, had no humanitarian instincts. But the true humanitarian has to understand that if you care about your neighbor, if you care about prosperity, if you care about the middle class, and if you want to maximize wealth and fairly distribute it better than any other system, you have to believe in freedom. You have to believe in sound money, and you have to believe in the free market. Otherwise, it's a failed policy. It's a shame that we haven't been able to convince people in the past that a system of freedom is a humanitarian system. Instead, we lost that argument, but guess what? We're starting to win it now because the failure is all around us, whether it's the failure of the housing program or the failure of the foreign policy with these endless wars, the failure of the government to protect our civil liberties in the name of freedom. They come and attack us and invade our homes without search warrants. Let me tell you, the defenders of the re our revolution and the writers of the Constitution would be embarrassed if they knew what we were putting up with with our own government. But once again, they play on fears and innuendos and, uh, and, uh, and try to scare the people. After 9-11, of course, we had to go after the bad guys. And I voted to go after the bad guys, to go after the al-Qaeda that was responsible. But look, it took over 10 years to get hold of bin Laden. At the same time, they took 10 years to invade countries they, they were just itching to invade in and occupy. They used it as an excuse. But what about what they did to, the, what the Congress and the President did to the American people? The American people weren't guilty, but what has happened? They went and immediately passed the Patriot Act, which undermines your liberties. The Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is one thing for certain. It is not patriotic. So the best thing we can do with the Patriot Act is repeal it as quickly as possible. You know, I was... Uh, I was convinced that if he had a different name on the Patriot Act, if that it had to repeal the Fourth Amendment Act, nobody would have voted for it. <laughs> so uh, instead of saying we're going to repeal the Patriot Act, how about restore the Fourth Amendment to the American people? But there's been a lot of other attacks on our civil liberties systematically. In a time of war and an economic crisis, it seems like in the past that people are too willing to give up their liberties, even though our founders warned us. And that they said, if you're willing to give up your liberties for safety and security, you're going to end up losing both. And I am convinced. I, the more I think about it, I'm absolutely convinced. If, if it is safety and security that you want, you never have to give up any of your rights at all, any of your privileges, never. But actually, under the conditions that we have today of uh, the economic crisis that came, uh, they uh, uh, blamed, of course, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, there was too much freedom and too much free markets, and the Depression was blamed on the gold standard and free markets, so therefore they had to get rid of those very things. And it's only now, the first time in 100 years, that we got the real culprit out on front who creates the business cycle, creates the bailouts for the privileged class, and that is the Federal Reserve System.
But the, the entitlement system has been with us too long, and this idea that entitlements are right is absolutely wrong. They are not rights. You do not have these rights to take from other people. So, but this is the reason that we have to understand what personal liberty is all about. And we have to know where liberty comes from. It doesn't come from our government. Our government can't give us our liberty. Okay, they, government can't give us our right to our life. Uh, they're supposed to protect our liberties and protect our property, but they have done the opposite. We have to understand that our lives and our liberties come from our creator, not from our government. And in a limited constitutional republic, the purpose of the government is to protect those liberties, to protect your right to own property, not to control the property and tell you when you can use it and can't use it and how you can use it, and then you have to pay the rental, I mean taxes on it, you know. <laughs> And anything goes wrong, they're going to blame you or use this ex excuse for extreme uh, environmental positions that some people take. I think, I think we have lost the concept of private property, but it really was initiated with this whole concept of the income tax. The income tax, even if you paid a small amount, it's very, very dangerous because the income tax is based on the assumption that everything you earn belongs to the government. But then the government will write a law and permit you to keep a certain portion as long as you follow the rules and what the conditions are. So we've conceded the whole argument that it belongs to the government and therefore they control our property, they control our lives and uh, undermines the, the really the productive uh, segment of the economy. And uh, this is why uh, I'm so sad that we weren't able to defend this position because there's no reason in the world why we should ever give up on the defense of this if we care about people. If you want to help people, you want prosperity, you want jobs. But look at the results. To, today, I think the, re, the evidence is so clear, more than ever in our history. Before, you know, we'd have these mild turns, but we would never have the horrendous debt. And this is a worldwide problem brought on uh, through the monetary system. So we have the opportunity now to defend what we believe in, that it's government fails. Has government done a good job overseas? No, the government is bankrupting us. And that's exactly what Al-Qaeda wanted. They wrote about it. And they say, we want to do this. We want to antagonize the Americans. They're going to come over and they're going to get bogged down in various countries. We know what we'll do. They thought we might go into one country or two. They never dreamed we'd be in six and seven and looking and getting anxious for the next few to go into. Right now, we have an administration and a majority in Washington, D.C. They can't wait till they can get involved in Syria, then they're going to march to, uh, into Iran. We don't need that attitude. But, but what we need to do is, is know why it's important for us to understand these principles because it's vitally important now. But today, the, the failure is all around us, whether it's the housing programs, the economy, the failure of the monetary system. And that is why we have this opportunity to present the case. Now, do we have to start from scratch? No. Other countries might have to when they get this way. But we had the greatest experiment in, the, in, in, in freedom than any other country. And therefore, we were the wealthiest country ever. We had the largest middle class ever. And because we have rejected those convictions, where are we today? Our middle class is shrinking. The jobs are going away. Our students are graduating with horrendous debts and no jobs available to them. So this is a... This is, this is obviously a time that we have to challenge the status quo, and this is, uh, what, is, this is what the problem is with uh, what we're being offered today. The other candidates offer just tinkering around the edges with the status quo. They don't challenge foreign policy. They don't challenge monetary policy. They don't challenge the attack on our civil liberties, and they don't, attack, and they don't challenge the attack on the spending. Nobody else is talking about cutting spending. And for a starter, I want to cut a trillion dollars out of the budget in the first year. And I have some people who will get up in a smaller audience when we get to discuss a few of these, and they say, how's that, how's that going to help the government spend this money? Isn't this all an economic stimulus? I said, no, it's an economic negative. 
The government, where do they get the money? They either inflate, which is destructive to all of us, or they tax us and they take it out. So we lose there. But then when they spend it, they say they invest it. Governments can't invest. They have no idea what investments mean. They spend it and give it to their cronies, and they bail out the rich folks on Wall Street and uh, on, in the military industrial complex, and they pass out this, this money. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't solve the problem at all. And this, this is why we have to say this is an opportunity for us to show what kind of conditions we have, where we have gone wrong, and what we need to do. But it wouldn't be all that complicated if we just had more people in Washington who at least read the Constitution. <laughs> that would be helpful. But systematically, uh, our, our civil liberty has been under attack. They've been under attack now and then um, over, over a period of time. Certainly during wartime, people get, let their guard down thinking, oh, it's unnecessary. And of course, I don't believe it ever is necessary. And, and it's certainly not because we're at war that we should give up our, uh, give up our liberties. But you know, on, on New Year's Day, the president gave us a, a wonderful New Year's present. He signed the National Defense Authorization Act. <laughs> So now he now the Congress did this, wrote the bill for him and said that he can use the military to arrest American citizens if they're a suspect with no charges, no trial, no attorney, secret prison and held indefinitely. And that's put into the law. So one thing, in addition to what you would see in a, in a, a republic with the elimination of the income tax and, and the Federal Reserve, you would see the repeal not only of the Patriot Act, you would make sure a president can never arrest somebody with the military on suspicion. Now, Without permission of the Congress, the president announced a year ago that uh, uh, the president, uh, he, he, it, it, he claims it's not prohibited in the Constitution, so therefore he's allowed to do it. So he says that uh, a president has the authority to assassinate American citizens, just out of the clear blue. Oh, only the bad guys. But I thought the trials were for the bad guys as much as the other guys to sort it all out. So. <laughs> I mean, we, we, gave, we gave trials to the Nazi uh, war criminals. We gave a trial to Timothy McVeigh. Uh, we, we've given trials to uh, the really b terrible people. But that is, is what it's supposed to be. But to just say that they were a suspect, in the, in the laws now say that uh, a suspect is somebody that uh, just might be associated with an organization, just an association. Maybe that's visiting a website. Maybe it's getting emails. Maybe it's attending a meeting. Who knows what it means? It's very, very vague. So this is why I am sure our founders would be very, very dis disappointed with what we're doing. But the good part is, is a lot of people are waking up to this and they're come becoming aware of exactly what's happening in Washington and they want to see it changed. <laughs> A couple of months ago when I started talking about the National Defense uh, Authorization Act, all I needed to say is exactly what I did a few minutes ago, say the name of the bill, and uh, there were boos and hisses because the people know, knew exactly what I was talking about. But I know you didn't hear it on national TV, and you didn't hear it from the politicians, and you don't read it in a newspaper, but fortunately, we do have an internet, and that is the way information of great value is now being spread. But once again, I, th I think those who are threatened by what we're trying to do know that the internet is a danger to them. It's a blessing to us. So this is the reason they had Stop Online Piracy Act, to take over the internet. But this should give us encouragement because a lot of people heard about it. A few of us spoke out, and guess what? They heard your voices, and they withdrew those bills, both from the House and the Senate. So this means that we still have enough freedom in this country 
to have an effect on, on the government, and this is our goal. For me, you know, a lot of, you know, we call things the Patriot Act and other things, and who are the patriots and who aren't. And we, as too often, have heard, especially in Washington, when I've taken a position against going to war without a declaration, which sounded to me like a rather patriotic idea, but they would accuse me of being un-American and un unpatriotic. But there is nothing unpatriotic about challenging your government when your government is wrong. That, unfortunately, makes it very easy for us to be patriotic because so many opportunities to challenge our government. <laughs> because we can do it from, you know, property rights on down and monetary policy and war policy, the whole works, and, and civil liberties. But we, we are at a, at a point where we have to make a decision. If we continue to do what we're doing and not cut back on spending, they say, well, we can't let anybody fall through the cracks and nobody's proposing these cuts. If we can continue to do this, we destroy everything because we'll have runaway inflation. You cannot spend money endlessly. You can't have a debt of $1.3 or $1.6 trillion every year and monetize that debt and print the money. They're still taking our money and that's why it's holding together. But one of these days there's going to be an event in the world someplace and already there's starting to be hints that they're serious about going into Iran. Oil is now $103 and they're expecting $4 of gasoline. As a matter of fact, I think up in this area of the country, the gasoline prices are pretty high. But it could get a lot worse on that and it can move rapidly. And this will hurt everybody no matter how badly you want to take care of poor people by sending them more money. What if the money doesn't work? What if it doesn't buy anything? So they'll, it'll be at a point of no return and that's why continuing to do what we're doing is the worst thing that we can do. The most important thing is to admit the truth. Instead of putting our heads in the sand and saying, oh, there's no problems, we can work our way out of it. Uh, you know, the central bankers know what they're doing and, and, and you know, uh, the Congress will finally get their act together. Boy, that's a dream, isn't it? <laughs> So, but th this, is, um, th th this is important for us to uh, figure out what we're going to do. And, and to me, it is not difficult. It would take a year or so to get back on our feet, but not much longer. Right now, we're into our fourth year of this super recession. If you talk to, to the people who are unemployed, actually, if you go back to the old method of calculating unemployment, it's 22%. And the government is saying, well, it, maybe it's a little higher, but at least we don't have inflation. Yeah, we, we don't have inflation. Uh, inflation, ask the people who are on fixed incomes, who are receiving Social Security. They know darn well that they're not keeping up and their standard of living is going down. So just because they say there's no price inflation, believe me, they can't convince the American people. Uh, they can get away with it for a while, and they can even fool the markets for a while. But now is the time that we have to make a decision. Decision. And the decision has to be, is it going to be more government or is it going to be more freedom? I know where I'm going. <laughs> I have, I have often said, because I firmly believe that if I could have my freedom but less prosperity, I would take my freedom. But the, but the wonderful thing is, is we don't have to make a choice. The more freedom we have, the more prosperity there will be. But the more self-reliance there has to be. Assumption that we're responsible for our lives. And that's what freedom is all about. Understanding that freedom comes to us, as I said, in a natural way. We get our lives and our liberties from an outside source, a natural way or a God-given way. And therefore, your life is your own. Your life is yours to make, uh, make it worthwhile. or Your life is yours to waste. It is, it is up to you. If you deliver that responsibility to the government to take care of us from cradle to grave, they, can own, they, they can't do it, but in their effort to do it, they destroy our liberties. And this is what has happened for too long, and of course, the benefits go to the wealthy rather than the poor that it was in, intended. But the magnificent thing about our country, at least at the beginning, but we have lost, is freedom was seen as a whole unit. Freedom was seen as an individual thing, civil liberties, a right to our religious, a right to read books, 
the right to put into our bodies what we want. They weren't separate things. You know, they were all one thing. And then economic liberty was the same thing. But today we have some people, a token effort to defend economic liberty and freedom in, in the marketplace. But the other, there will be another group will say, well, we have to watch civil liberties, but we don't like the way you're spending your money. We're going to take your money and spend it for you. There is nothing wrong with putting this back together as the founders understood it. Freedom is, is yours. Freedom is your life. Freedom is the right to your liberty. And it ought to be the right to keep your, the fruits of all your labors. And this would, would so, so solve so many problems. And it's a system. Some people don't like the idea. And they say, well, some people might misuse their freedoms. And they'll do things I just don't approve of. Well, so what? <laughs> But some people, some people might get their money and they might not spend it like I do because I'm pretty much of a miser. You know, I try to protect my money and I'm not a gambler. But if somebody wants to gamble, that's okay. But they shouldn't come to me and expect me to bail them out when they gamble their money away. In the same, in the same way with, with a perf personal lifestyle, if it's, if it's not good for you and hurts you, you have to assume that responsibility. But the other magnificent thing about this understanding about what liberty is all about, you don't have to ask people what they're going to do with their liberty. But when it goes to the government, then you have to ask and you have to fight over to get some of your money back. And then they have all the rules and regulations of what you, kind of hoops you have to jump through to get your money back from it, whether it comes to the state or you as, as an individual. But if if you can bring people together and allow them to use their liberty any way they want except don't hurt anybody, don't take their property, be honest with people, but use your life and your money and your liberty as you so choose. Then all of a sudden you see people coming together, not because they agree with their religion or not because they agree with the books that you're going to read or, or what you want to study or not because of your lifestyle, but you come together because we all agree that we want to be free people. We want to be ourselves. And the one thing to remember is the fact that if you legalize freedom of choice in everything possible except that which uses violence, it doesn't mean you endorse anything that they do. I mean, if somebody wants to take their religious liberties and practice a religion, you, you figure, boy, that doesn't make any sense to me. But, but that's, that's up to them as long as they're not pushing it on us. This is why, of course, theocracies are so bad and, I, and our efforts to tell other people around the world. If we don't want our next door neighbor to telling us what to do on Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays, why in the world should we accept the notion that the people around the world are going to accept us to tell them how to run their countries? <laughs> Of course, when we, go, when we go over there, as always with good intentions, we go over to make the world safe for democracy. We're going to spread democracy. If you don't do it, we're going to bomb you. But, uh, but we go over there, and they finally, we finally get control of the country, and we come up with these uh, elections, and they have an election. And lo and behold, they finally get an election, but they elect the wrong people, so we won't even accept them as their leaders. I mean, they have to elect the ones we tell them to elect. It's such a farce and such a pretense that it's this acceptance of people that uh, should, whether it's international or domestically or economically, bring people together on this whole idea and uh, tolerate people without saying that you endorse what they do. There is no reason why this shouldn't be able, in, this, in our society, in this country especially, this should bring people together and has over the years. But one other danger has been too often in our early history, we took away rights for people belonging to certain groups. But rights don't belong to anybody because they belong to a group. They should never be taken away from anybody belong because they belong to a certain group. But, but also, privileges shouldn't be passed out and rights cannot be passed out to certain groups. You don't have rights because you belong to a group. You have rights because you're an individual and your rights came to you in a natural way and not because government gave them to you or because you belong to a certain group. I am, I am fully convinced 
that if we would restore this message and understanding, not go backwards at all because freedom is a young idea. It's not thousands of years old. Tyranny is thousands of years old. Even inflation is thousands of years old. So it's just been in recent memory, not memory, but the last 100 or 200 years, especially in our life, in the lifetime of our country, that this has been tested. And it worked rather well and we gave up on it. So right now, that is what we have to do. Not only should we restore those principles, we don't have to go back and be firmly fixed in an age of 100, 200 years ago. We can have a better monetary policy. We can have a better understanding what the concept of liberty is. We can have a better understanding of property rights. We can have a better understanding how the world works better with very limited governments and less bombs. So this is a, this is a system. You know, um, we, it, it was said early in our, in our history by Samuel Adams that, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't take a majority, and it really does, and the majority of the people usually go along with leaders, and a, a group like this is usually in the minority. We remain in the minority. Most people vote at the last minute, and uh, they check around. So the minority, it, what uh, Adams said, is that in order to bring about change, you have to have a tireless, irate minority, and it's not necessary to have the majority. But that minority has to be doing something. They have, and with the way he described it, you have to be starting brush fires of liberty in the minds of men. And that is, and that, I can report to you is what's happening in this country today. There are a lot of brush fires every single day, every day in the last few days I come and I find that there are already brush fires starting in these many, many communities around the country. People are looking, uh, looking toward this whole concept of liberty. So this, this is, is definitely moving in the right direction. We have people who have been sitting on the bylines for decades now. They sort of gave up. They, were, they, they didn't feel like they were being represented. They're coming out of the woodworks and they do understand what real liberty is all about because it's, it's coming alive again. But the most encouragement should come from the younger generation who are waking up and they love the ideas of liberty. So in spite of our problems, we can be optimistic. We have a better chance now than ever before. So I welcome you. I hope you will stay engaged and stay involved. There's an election coming up. Please participate and do your job now that you uh, are part of the understanding of what has to be done. I tell people, if you know and understand this, you're one of the few. You're in the minority, but you play an important role. So if you do understand exactly what I'm talking about, you will feel obligated. You'll feel uncomfortable if you don't go out and do your job. And I thank you very much for coming out today. My friends in Liberty, we must turn our passions into action. Hey, where's your Bobby's Bible? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me see it. We have a place right behind you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. You can go to church with it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. 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 Thank Okay, good to see everybody. Sorry for the rush. They have me on a busy schedule. Hello there. Sign that right there. On the balloon? And this one. Oh, I can't Can you sign my flag? Appreciate it. We're working hard for you. There you go. Real quick. The Chinese are really proud of you. Can you sign my... my yeah, Very good. What do you want me to do? Sign it? There you go. Thanks for coming out. Good to see everybody. We can barely do this. Time is short. Have you signed your balloon, Jimmy? Ah, it's making a mess. Take your pen. Take your pen.
put a coin in your pocket, though. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much. You're going to be able to Okay, okay. Sorry for the rush. Okay, okay. Guys, watch the... Watch the yeah. My problem is i got to go to the airport. Airport, take the pen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, wonderful. What's that? We got a photo over here. People over there yet? Yes, Volunteers, volunteers only.